then Robert Siegler, who many of you know is the Director General of IRI, the International Rice Research Institute, which is part of the, one of the flagship centres of CGAIR, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, uh, which this year is marking its 50th uh, anniversary for taking cutting-edge uh, agricultural research and improved crop and production technologies through to the, to the farmer at, the, uh, right, at, at all levels internationally. A plant specialist uh, in his own right with experience in the Congo and the Burundi. He's also worked and led programs with CJIR uh, SEAT in uh, Colombia prior to leading IRI, which as many of you know is headquartered in the Philippines. For a long time, haven't this? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, when, when we look at uh, your question, what has changed, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is what has not changed. And that is that uh, we still have uh, the vast majority of the world's rice being uh, supplied by very small farmers. We have 200 million rice farms in, in Asia alone. Uh, now, in terms of what has been changing, I think this is, uh, is extremely exciting from a research institute perspective. Uh, and that is we're seeing farmers having access to, uh, to tools of communication unlike they've ever had, ever had before. We've heard uh, a number of speakers uh, over the last couple of days uh, repeatedly bring up uh, the uh, prevalence of cell phone technology. And I think that that means of communication is, is something that will completely revolutionize uh, small order production at a global level. Um, we look at, we've heard a lot about seed uh, production uh, and how new seeds can, can revolutionize uh, production systems around the world. Jeff Riggs mentioned some of our flood tolerant rice that's going out. But I think we have an opportunity now to see the whole way that rice uh, farming and, and by extension other smallholder uh, agriculture uh, is being managed to be changed. Uh, we see uh, today uh, a technology that we're rolling out that will allow farmers to get real-time information about what is the best fertilizer to apply on their fields at what time in what formulations. It's only a small step to then see how that, with that information, they can have access to credit. Uh, and again, credit coming through a cell phone. Uh, that access to credit uh, will crack one of the most difficult nuts in, in uh, development that we've had uh, in developing countries uh, over the past decades. Uh, going beyond that, the uh, crop modeling, geographical information systems uh, that are coming together that can be used in, in a real-time way uh, allow us to begin to imagine a crop insurance program that would allow farmers to participate in the credit markets in, in a way that uh, would give them a, a, a level of power and decision-making they haven't enjoyed before. And of course, participating in markets uh, in a way that they are, have not traditionally been able to participate. That is, empowering them with the price information that Mr. Page talked about. So I think that some of, when we look at uh, how things are changing for small holders uh, around the world, I think it's we're on the, on, on the tip of a, of a revolution that we're just beginning to appreciate. Uh, we have uh, we've heard a mantra over the last uh, 20 years or so that the private sector can do everything. Well, the private sector can do an awful lot. But one of the things that it's not particularly good at is a lot of the innovative research uh, that is pre-competitive. It actually goes out to, to, to creating a platform upon which uh, new technologies, new products are, are built. And I think we have to keep in mind that without a vibrant public sector research dimension to our whole overall uh, food security strategy, over the long run, we're going to run into trouble. Phil Pardee uh, here at the University of Minnesota has done some outstanding work that's shown that uh, a reduction, uh, a dramatic reduction in investment in public sector research uh, will show up as a drying up pipeline after only about 15 years. So you can have a short term cut in, in public spending and research and not see the consequences of that for, for a decade or more, uh, which is a very dangerous scenario when you put that sort of thing in the hands of politicians. Um, now, I think, now having said that, the, uh, there is a very important role for, uh, for the private sector. This is someone who spent his entire life in the public sector. I'm seeing more and more that there is going to be a much more uh, positive contribution by the private sector 
uh, in its relationship with the public sector. I think there is a, a much more mature relationship uh, uh, that allows us now to enter into the kinds of partnerships that would have been unthinkable uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Before Al Gore's movie came out, An Inconvenient Truth, I used to talk about a convenient convergence uh, of this nexus of food security and climate change. And that is basically that uh, addressing, and I think one of our speakers this morning alluded to this, that when you address the, the challenges that, that smallholders, particularly rice uh, farmers, uh, are facing, drought, floods, uh, seawater intrusion, etc., uh, that are being uh, uh, becoming more of a concern because of climate change, you also address the needs that are directly affecting, or challenges that are directly, directly affecting farmers today. So I think it's not an either-or kind of thing. And likewise, when you look at the, uh, uh, the challenge of, uh, challenges of greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating uh, the, uh, the impact of agriculture on, on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, managed properly, they're uh, economically, should be very uh, attractive to farmers economically. So I think that uh, by applying uh, ourselves and, and, and looking at the challenges uh, from the perspectives, both of the farmers' needs today, the needs of the environment uh, tomorrow, and the challenges that will be uh, uh, facing farmers in the future, uh, we have an opportunity to, to develop uh, multiple win uh, solutions and multiple win scenarios. And I'm extremely sympathetic with the European farmer uh, who is, instead of being allowed to, to take the best of technology and, and, and aggressively uh, meet the demands of society, that same society is placing constraints on the farmers. And I hope that that, that doesn't happen uh, in developing countries. Uh, my place is uh, Bertrand area. Uh, what is the uh, research work on GM rice in Guinea? Uh, since we have a variety of problems like uh, biotic and IBI express, uh, we have, uh, we need uh, salad tolerant variety, blood tolerant variety, drought tolerant variety, and other uh, uh, biotic uh, uh, pest disease and uh, weed problem, all such things we need. Is there any research work going on in uh, IRI? Uh, yes, uh, in a word, yes. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of activity in precisely the areas you, you outlined. Uh, the vast majority of that work uses tools of biotechnology, particularly marker-assisted selection. Uh, very little of it, if any, is involving the use of transgenic or GMOs. Uh, we are moving these materials uh, uh, with our partners uh, across Asia, in particular uh, in, in South Asia and India, uh, uh, through various state governments, universities, and we are seeing them actually move into farmers' fields. Uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, looking at the uh, partnership with the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, uh, we expect to have these materials moving out and benefiting your, yourself and your colleagues in the, in the rice fields over the next uh, uh, several years. What is the state of the Golden Rice Project? Uh, Golden Rice is, uh, is in its uh, final stages. Uh, as we speak, it is being uh, field tested. Uh, we have transferred the uh, pro vitamin A beta carotene uh, capacity to the background of uh, varieties that uh, farmers uh, know and like, for example, IR64, uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, that's grown by many farmers in India, uh, equally popular varieties in Bangladesh, Vietnam, and, and the Philippines. Uh, an extensive network of relationships that we've built up over the last uh, 50 years uh, with civil society, NGOs, uh, national research systems, uh, uh, and government agencies uh, that allow us to receive a lot of direct feedback uh, from, from farmers, uh, exactly what they need, what they want, and uh, equally importantly, uh, how technology is, is working for them and how it's not working. And I think that, that, that relation, uh, relationship has allowed us to guide the development of next generation technologies. We started our agricultural development program. We announced a package of six grants. They totaled just over $300 million and they were designed to help more than five million poor farming families in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia improve their lives. These grants span the agricultural value chain, much like what I described in our work with Heifer International and the East African Dairy uh, Project. And they amount to a test case of our strategy. And I invite all of you to look at the Foundation's website where we are tracking the progress 
of these grants. Two years in, these grants are having a direct impact on hundreds of thousands of farm families and are on track to reach their goals. And I want to give you just one example. We gave a grant to the International Rice Research Institute to develop a variety of rice that can tolerate submergence so that rice farmers aren't wiped out by floods. There you can see on the just look at, yeah. There you can see on the right-hand side the so-called sub-1 variety of rice that tolerates submergence next to the rice on the other side that you can't see because it has died underneath the water. Now by the end of this year, more than 400,000 farmers will be planting this variety. And by 2017, we project that 20 million farmers will benefit from it. And that is tangible progress. Smaller holders in sustainability, sustainable agriculture, one of the really important uh, uh, methods by which they could ensure sustainability of agriculture was by genetic heterogeneity bringing a number of varieties, mixed cropping, uh, large number of varieties grown, what we now call land races, over 1,50,000 land races of rice varieties are available, and of them more than 100,000 are in the gene bank of the International Rice Research Institute. Farmers have always valued diversity, they are the great conservers. In the broad world of biodiversity, if you take agro-biodiversity, economically important crops and so on, agro-diversity is the product of interaction between biodiversity and cultural diversity on one hand, and biodiversity and culinary diversity on the other hand. The way in which we use the things, very large. The second recipient of this year's Elaine Simoniak Intern Award is from Mount Vernon, Iowa. She completed her summer internship at the International Rice Research Institute in Los Banos, Philippines, and attends St. Olaf College. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate Lauren Schefter.